Hi everybody, I am going to talk about understanding supervision, development of personal and professional self and reasons for supervision. Supervision is used to train and support the workers at the beginning stage and as a means of quality control in the delivery of services to people. Ultimately, supervision is performed for the benefit of the service rather than for the case worker. Its effectiveness is measured by the extent to which efforts to help workers improve their job performance result in better service and improved workers ability to respond to the needs of the person with the problem. At the end of this talk, you will understand the meaning and objectives of supervision in social casework practice, learn the functions of supervisor and the sources of supervisory authority or power, know the types of supervision and grasp the responsibilities of supervision. Kaudushin and Harkness defined supervision in social work as the process of overseeing directing, coordinating, enhancing and evaluating the on-the-job performance of workers for whom the supervisor is responsible. A supervisor is often known as an overseer and the one who watches over others' work with responsibility for its quality. A good supervisory relationship is the best way we know to ensure that we stay open to ourselves and our clients. Ongoing supervision is a professional requirement for all the persons who are participating in the process of casework. The functions of the supervision are to facilitate the enhancement of the caseworker's theoretical knowledge, skills and personal development. Let me outline the objectives of supervision. The objective of supervision is both short range and long range. The long range objective refers to the supervisory process that aims at improving the case worker's capacity to do his or her job more effectively. It is to help the worker grow and develop professionally maximize his or her clinical knowledge and skills to the point where he or she can perform autonomously and independently. The short range objective of supervision is to help the caseworker to provide the person with a particular service that is offered. The ultimate objective is to offer efficient and effective service to the person with the problem. Let me now describe the functions of the supervisor. There are three basic functions of supervision which are administrative, educational and supportive. Administrative function refers to the administrative tasks of supervision that require managerial skills the supervisor is responsible for providing case workers with the work structure and access to agency resources that allow them to do their jobs well. He is concerned with such issues as a case worker's productivity, progress and workload and whether they are following the agency's procedures. Most supervisors focus heavily on administrative tasks because these tasks play an important role in fulfilling the demands of accountability faced by their agency. In short, the long-term objective of administrative supervision is to provide a systemic coordination of effort by providing a set of rules that are applied equally to all the staff. The short-term objective is to provide the case worker with the information necessary to work effectively. 
the educational function requires teaching skill and technical knowledge. The supervisor is expected to provide the training that allows case workers to achieve their objectives and the skills that prepare them to do their jobs more effectively and independently. Educational function is about teaching the worker what needs to be known in order to perform the job and includes the skills, knowledge and approach to the work. The short term objective is to improve the worker's capacity to do his or her job effectively. Educational function involves the tasks such as creating a common frame of reference, evaluating the absorption of information, focusing on the content areas regarding the client's agency, process, problems or issues and personnel and effecting purposeful and conscious use of self through self-reflection. The supportive tasks of supervision call for interpersonal skills. The supervisor is responsible for making sure that the case workers have the necessary psychological and personal resources to operate effectively at an emotional level. This allows the case workers to do their job more successfully and derive satisfaction from their work. Supportive supervision provides the management of work-related stress and assistance to staff in coping with work-related issues. The importance of case workers' psychological well-being cannot be underestimated. If the case worker can be positive about the issues being faced, the outcome of his or her work will be better. Supportive supervision involves certain tasks such as reassurance, encouragement, recognition of achievement, constructive criticism and genuine appraisals. Let me tell you about the supervisory authority. Power in this context refers to the ability to implement one's authority. Let me outline the types of power underlying a supervisor's authority. First, reward power. The ability to control tangible rewards and psychic rewards. For reward power to be effective, case workers must believe that their supervisor has authority to make decisions concerning rewards and it must be apparent to case workers that rewards are distributed based on their job performance. Coercive power refers to the ability to control tangible punishments and psychic punishments. For coercive power to be effective, case workers must believe that the supervisor is likely to take disciplinary action. Legitimate or positional power means that power stems from the authority associated with the position of the supervisor regardless of the position held. The case worker believes that the supervisor simply because of his position has a legitimate right to expect the case workers to follow his authority. Reference power comes from the case workers identification with his or her supervisor and eagerness to be like the supervisor and liked by him. Having a positive relationship with a case worker provides a supervisor with a source of power for influencing the case worker's behavior and attitudes. When a case worker identifies with his or her supervisor, he or she internalizes his expectations. Lastly, the expert power exists when the supervisor has special knowledge and skills that his supervisees 
is in need of. And this form of power is more useful to areas in which the supervisor has expertise. This power may also stem from the supervisor's expert knowledge in areas like policies, procedures and operations in the working agency. Let me tell you about compliance versus internalization. Reward and coercive power usually produce compliance and a change in behavior, particularly when a caseworker knows that he or she is being observed. Compliance occurs when a person changes his or her behavior in order to obtain a reward or avoid punishment. Compliance is public and does not involve a private change in opinions or attitudes. Expert and referent power are more effective for producing conformity, both attitudinal conformity which implies an internalization of influence and overt conformity behavior. Internalization happens when a person changes his or her behavior because he or she usually accepts the beliefs, attitudes or behaviors of another person. These five sources of power have been classified into two groups, namely formal and functional power. Formal power is legitimate and positional. Functional power refers to expert and referent power. Formal power is related to the title or position a supervisor holds and the authority delegated to that position. It is gained automatically when a person becomes a supervisor and there is little difference between supervisors in the same agency with regard to their formal power. Functional power depends on the person holding the position of supervisor. Functional power has to be earned and continuously re-earned by the supervisor and there may be big differences between supervisors at the same agency with reference to their functional power because of differences in their expertise and interpersonal skills. Problems tend to arise when a supervisor with formal power lacks sufficient functional power. For example, when the supervisor is less knowledgeable or has not gained the respect of those under his or her authority, the supervisor is more likely to lack functional power. Let me now mention the guidelines for using supervisory authority effectively. The supervisor has to exercise authority only when necessary to achieve the objectives he or she and the caseworker have agreed upon. The supervisor has to exercise his or her authority in a predictable manner. He or she has to exercise his or her authority in an impartial manner. The supervisor should communicate to the caseworker the reasons underlying a directive and discuss it with him or her. The supervisor should use the least amount of authority needed to accomplish the objectives of supervision. For example, simply providing information may be sufficient for inducing a caseworker to change his or her behavior in the desired direction. Finally, when a client gives informed consent to receive supervised services, he or she grants oversight authority to the worker's supervisor. In this context, informing the client means providing him or her with information about the supervisor's qualifications, the supervisor's goals, methods 
and responsibilities and the relevant limits to confidentiality. Let me briefly mention how to provide constructive criticism to the concerned caseworker. Constructive criticism or feedback to the concerned caseworker should be given as soon as possible. It should be specific and objective. It should be descriptive rather than judgmental. The feedback should highlight the positive impact of a good performance. It should be focused on the behavior of the caseworker and not about the person. The feedback should be related to the needs of supervision. It should contain shared ideas and alternatives which can be effectively grasped. Let me describe the features of supervisory relationship. Supervisory relationship is meant to support and encourage the caseworker. It teaches a caseworker to integrate the theoretical knowledge and practice. It helps to assess the maintenance of standard. It is a medium through which professional values and ethics are transmitted. It develops a caseworker's insight into his or her own experience of casework practice. It enables a caseworker to develop skills and build self-confidence. It facilitates the caseworker to share his or her vulnerability, disappointment and to be aware of the limitations. Supervised relationship can help the caseworker to move forward in the process of casework if he or she feels stuck. It gives an opportunity for the caseworker to evaluate his or her work and its effectiveness. It depicts the progress or the lack of progress of casework practice with a person. Supervisory relationship can energize the caseworker. Let me outline the responsibilities of caseworkers in supervision. Supervision is a process, not an event. It entails preparation, open discussion, and the implementation of decisions. Both supervisors and supervisees have a responsibility to contribute positively to this process. Supervisors should ensure adherence to the standards outlined in the policy. Supervisees or the caseworkers will make a substantial contribution to the quality of their own supervision by ensuring that actions agreed within the supervision are carried out in a timely manner. Notifying the supervisor of any difficulties in implementing decisions or plans Identifying development and support needs. Understanding and implementing the policy. Where the supervisee is a practitioner, he or she will also contribute to the supervision process by ensuring that there is a written plan for each client, the desirable outcomes for each person are defined, including the purpose of contact and agreed interventions and progress measured against these. The caseworker should see to it that case files contain clear analysis, plans and summaries and diversity is integrated into all work and records. Supervisors will make a substantial contribution to the quality of supervision by adhering to the standards. Neither supervisors nor supervisees are likely to maximize the benefit of supervision unless they are adequately trained to understand and carry out their duties. Supervision must be integrated into induction process and training must be provided. There are three types of supervision and let me explain each of these types. First, one-to-one -one supervision that refers to individual supervision in the formal agreement between the caseworker and a person with a problem where they meet on a regular basis to discuss the casework process. The advantage of this type is that in this particular supervision, 
the time is wholly the case workers and the entire session is confidential. Second, co-supervision or peer supervision which is usually recommended for the experienced case worker who meets on a regular basis. The advantage is the mix of different views and hearing about different cases and the skills used. The insights gained are increased as each case is explored and as different skills and techniques are shared. 3. Group supervision which is a formal arrangement between small groups of case workers who meet on a regular basis. Typically, the case worker assumes a responsibility for dividing the supervision among the group members. The advantage of this supervision is that the members benefit from the feedback on the quality of the practice from both the side. Let me now mention about the approaches to supervision. First, focus on the problem. The characteristics of this approach are exploration of the problem, concentration on mainly what took place, probing into the case worker's feelings and the case work relationship and discussion on more in the then and there than in the here and now. This approach may create a good relationship between the expert and the novice who seeks to please. Because there is often a climate of criticism in this problem-centered style of supervision, there may be a tendency for the case worker to skate over the events he or she is ashamed of. Two, focus on the case worker. The characteristics of this approach are the case worker relationship and what is happening within the case worker. Feelings are more readily acknowledged and supervision is carried out in an uncritical atmosphere. The underlying belief in this approach is that learning is only meaningful if it is personal. So it is advocated that links are made between situation in casework and the case worker's own circumstances. 3. Focus on the interaction. The characteristics of this approach is that it takes into account both the problem and the case work relationship. The interaction between the case worker and the person with the problem may in some way be reflected in the supervision relationship. Recognizing the interaction and working with it is likely to provide the case worker with the invaluable first-hand experience. Let me sum up. Supervision is used to train and handhold the case workers who are beginners and as a means of quality control in the delivery of services. Ultimately, Supervision is performed for the benefit of the casework practice rather than for the caseworker. The short range objective of supervision is to help the caseworker to provide the person with a particular service that is offered. The ultimate objective is to offer efficient and effective service to the person with problem. The three basic functions of supervision are administrative, educational and supportive. Supportive supervision involves certain tasks such as reassurance, encouragement, recognition of achievement, constructive criticism and genuine appraisals. PA refers to the ability to implement one's authority. The types of PA underlying a supervisor's authority include reward PA, coercive PA, legitimate or positional power, referent power and expert power. Formal power is legitimate and positional and functional power refers to expert and referent power. 
there are three types of supervision. They are one-to-one -one supervision, co-supervision or peer supervision and group supervision. There are three types of approaches in supervision namely focus on the problem, focus on the caseworker and focus on the interaction. The effectiveness of supervision is measured by the caseworker's improved ability to respond to the needs of the person with problem and better quality of service. Let me sign off now and hope to see you in another session. Thank you.